I'd like now to draw your attention to the last formal bit of our agenda, and I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Akim Steiner to give his concluding remarks. Um, Akim Steiner is Executive Director of UNEP. Thank you, Thank you very much. I, I feel a bit sorry for you because you were already in cocktail mode, and now I'm put behind this uh, rostrum here, so please keep on drinking. And this is more the companion entertainment because um, I, uh, I had been on my way uh, to Brussels and when I realized that I could um, sit in on part of the conversation this afternoon, I wrote to the organizers and said, um, very happy to come because I think some of the discussions that you've obviously had today, but even more important in terms of the platform, in terms of the institutions that you represent, and I mean, I have quite a few familiar faces here, Wendy and Gert, who I, I think probably just had to leave, um, and others. My interest was to connect a little bit more to the discussion that is happening in terms of an agricultural constituency. And you just heard, I think there is a little bit of a danger that, um, you know, climate change is a little bit like in uh, the Donald Duck stories and so on. Suddenly dollar signs appear in everybody's eyes and we all redefine our strategies in terms of response to climate change. In principle, nothing wrong with that. I mean, it is a market for funding and a market for financing for many different agendas. The problem is we are increasingly undermining our capacity to deal with the development challenge of the 21st century by continuing to operate as if we are in some sort of competitive, sectorally based, institutionally focused environment. And nowhere else is this more true than in agriculture. Because agriculture, first of all, touches on literally every human being on this planet. Whether you live in a city and are a consumer of agricultural products, whether you live in the countryside and produce them, whether you are a fish who uh, can no longer survive because you have to disappear because deoxygenated zones of the coasts of our world's um, river basins are causing major problems, whether it is the loss of topsoil that is driving people out of their century-old patterns of production and settlement, whether it is the prospect of you know, the disappearance of the glaciers in the Himalayas that over the next 30 to 50 years will fundamentally alter the entire hydrological cycle and also flow regime around which not only agriculture has established itself, but indeed the entire infrastructure of hundreds of millions of people has been developed. Whether it is through sea level rise and saltwater intrusions in deltas such as in Bangladesh and other places, you name it, the future of agriculture affects literally everybody on this planet. And yet, what has disturbed me particularly over the last year and a half as we faced this explosion in food prices, commodity prices, the world once again was confronted with the prospect of not being able to feed itself, that we were almost conducting this debate as if we were back in the 1950s and 1960s. And that is deeply disturbing. Deeply disturbing for two reasons. One is because it documents that we have not yet been able to overcome some of the conceptual, analytical discourse, name it what you like, barriers that have allowed agriculture to evolve at the end of the 20th century, not as the key to a sustainable future food security on the planet, but to bifurcate into a sector that remains marginal, that is focused around the farmer as a resource manager and a farming enterprise and business that essentially is conducting a mining operation on our planet. Now, before you get worried and you think, oh, you know, executive director of the UN Environment Program, I am the son of a farmer, I grew up on a farm, and my father is a plant breeder. So I take it at least that uh, you will trust me that I don't approach agriculture from the perspective of a critic, but rather from the perspective of somebody who has grown up and watched his own father rethink over his lifetime what agriculture should be in the future. Let's be very brutal. The last 200 years have been based on a simple model. It's a horizontal expansion model. We simply went further and further and further, brought more and more and more land under cultivation, sometimes because we were more in numbers, sometimes because we could use technology and therefore were able to expand the daily acreage that we could cover, but also, more often than not, because we could no longer farm the very land that we had been farming for either the last 10 years, the last 100 years, or perhaps the last 1,000 years. The reality is that the model of agriculture has to be rethought. 
And before one can effectively engage an agenda such as climate change, one has to go back to the future of agriculture itself. And to preach a green revolution along the lines of 30, 40 years ago as the answer to last year's food crisis, or as I would call it, food price crisis, is not at least the full answer, and certainly not the universal answer to the future of agriculture. As Wendy said just now, agriculture has tremendous potential to be part of the solution. At the moment, it is on an exponential curve of becoming a greater part of the problem. Now, that is not the farmer's fault, and this is where we have to begin. Do we conduct a debate about agriculture as a sector, as an economic sector, as a sector with a series of interests that the further away you come from the farm, the more powerful they actually become in terms of the signals in our economy? Or do we begin from where a farmer operates his or her land? Take a simple example, Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Forestry. Isn't this an absurd anachronism of the 20th and 19th century? If you drive just 10 minutes outside of Nairobi, you realize that there is no difference on a farmer's land between the way he looks at forests and trees as an asset in his production of a production system and crop production. So let us look first of all at agriculture also as something that is managed at the unit of management and not at the down the supply chain, so to speak, of input providers, advice providers, policy makers, and so on, who segment the agriculture agenda, as they do the energy agenda, the environment agenda, for that matter, into things that suit our particular mandates. When we talk about agriculture today, we still fall into the trap of thinking that the only way we can deal with seven, eight, nine billion people is to continue to push a maximum production model. The reality is that today we actually waste somewhere between 20 to 50 percent, depending on different parts of the world and different markets, of everything we spend a lot of money growing. We could easily feed right now 8 billion people on this planet with the total food production that is actually being produced, never mind what could be produced in the future. That at least is the numbers that we obtained when we produced, together with advice from FAO, from IFAD, CGIR, a book at the beginning of this year called The Environmental Food Crisis. To me, that was a stunning number. We spend an enormous amount of money simply to lose it somewhere between the farm and the rubbish bin of a restaurant in New York City or, where are we, in Brussels, or wherever else it might be. We, as you know, you have seen probably these images in the fisheries sector, but let's talk about terrestrial agriculture for the moment. My second point is that I think we have to embed the paradigm under which the agricultural sector has to develop, first and foremost from a future sustainability perspective. Climate change is a context for agriculture. Agriculture is a driver in climate change, but the two are not 100% conditioning each other. The future of agriculture, in my mind, has to be built around the paradigm of sustainability because it is in large part still today an extractive mining operation. The second shocking figure for me is the loss of topsoil that continues to occur every year across the planet. Our entire food security here depends on a layer about this thick, and we treat it almost like a plastic bag. There are figures in the report, I don't want to bore, them, bore you with them now, of literally hundreds of billions of dollars of net loss every year. And yet